Okay, so we have uh, some really interesting talks uh, in the research forum. What I'm going to do first is, uh, you know, give a quick outline of what to expect from this. So I put together some slides on what is the typical research forum, what is a typical research talk. And uh, I'm going to go through these set of slides in five minutes, and then we'll start with the peering talk, which is going to be given by Amog. Okay, so um, this is a deck of slides I put together, and this will give you an idea of what to expect. So we had a bunch of talks about IPv6. Now, how does a researcher look at IPv6? This is a typical example. Okay. <clears throat> Obviously, we need a motivation, so what's the motivation? We're running out of bits. This is a few nanogs ago when we had only three uh, characters for AS numbers, so there was a lot of confusion because Tom Schultz from at and had 701 as, as, as his AS number, so obviously running out of bits is a problem. So what do researchers do? We uh, look at public data from route views, write, et cetera, write a bunch of scripts with no comments, and uh, use a tremendous personal bias in interpreting the results. So that's, that's the theme of the rest of the talk, and I want to set this up front. So let's look at route stability. Now what I'm trying to do here is compare IPv4 with IPv6, right? And uh, clearly I can see Compared to 600k updates from IPv6 versus, uh, you know, sorry, v v4 versus 5k from v6, clearly v6 is 120 times more stable than v4. So that's conclusion number one. <coughs> downtime. <coughs> what we do is we measure the total number of prefix downtime over a one-month period, and we look at the number of v6 prefixes that have been down for more than one day or more than ten days, right? <coughs> so. Um, Numbers speak for themselves. IPv4 is 80 times, uh, you know, chance of downtime is 80 times more than IPv6. So that's another interesting result. <laughs> security. Now, in case of security, it's a little more tricky. We cannot really get a lot of insights. So what I did was I sent some surveys out. And uh, out of the 80 surveys, I asked, uh, basically, do you lose sleep over IPv6? And none of them said they lose sleep. So obviously, Nobody loses sleep over IPv6 security. So. <laughs> now, it's not enough to say that it's important uh, it, nobody loses sleep. The next question we want to answer is, how much does it cost to secure v6, right? And again, as a researcher, we're always looking at different metrics to identify this cost. Uh, uh, of course, when I tried to contact the security people, they wouldn't reply. So what I did was I went, at, went on Amazon and looked at how much does it cost to buy a book on security. <laughs> And uh, we can see from the sales rank that not only does it cost more to secure v4, but fewer people actually buy books to secure v6. So obviously, <laughs> v6 is a lot more secure by nature as a protocol. <laughs> so anyways, uh, I would like to stop this and uh, just set the theme for the rest of the session. What I want to uh, elaborate from uh, by this uh, deck of slides uh, is uh, essentially there's a bunch of researchers out here, and what we really need from you guys as a community, as Nano as a community, is feedback. And so stay through to the rest of the session and catch the individual speakers. And some of these speakers are coming up here for the first time, are very nervous talking in front of Nano. So take a chance, make use of this opportunity to grill them. This should be fun. <laughs> Thanks, Mohit. Uh, I feel a whole lot better now. And I think you've raised the expectations for my talk to, uh, really high now. So anyway, uh, thanks for being here, everyone. And my name is Amog. I'm currently at Keda. Um, and this is joint work with Constantine Dobrolis at Georgia Tech and Pierre Francois at UC Louvain. And the talk is going to be about a value-based framework for internet peering. So um, really, the motivation for this talk, as like, like Mohit said, like we are researchers looking at the operational community from the outside. What we tend to see is some amount of uncertainty when it goes to negotiating peering contracts. For example, consider these two networks A and B. At some point, they decided to become settlement-free peers. 
Um, and eventually, a, one of these two networks, A, starts wondering, why is B still a settlement free peer? Maybe um, starts thinking, does B actually benefit more from this link than I do? Do I should, should I actually try to demand some sort of payment? Should I threaten to depeer uh, the network if he doesn't pay me? And so on. And some of this uncertainty probably also extends to the case where these two networks are not already peers. So these two networks don't currently have any sort of business relationship. But they're trying to, I mean, one of them is thinking about, say, should I peer with the other network? Or um, what kind of peering should this be? Should this be settlement free, where no, no, um, no one actually gets any money out of it? Or um, should, I, should it be actually a paid peering relationship? Uh, if this is a paid peering link, then what sort of price should I be willing to offer to be? And what sort of price would we be willing to accept in order to uh, peer with me? So um, given this sort of background, I'll, this is just the outline of what I'm going to present in this talk. So I'll briefly touch upon what we see as happening in the real world in terms of uh, peering negotiations and peering contracts. And I'll propose what we call uh, our, our peering model called value-based peering. And uh, since I'm talking about value for a peering link, I'm going to go into some uh, details about how, how to go about estimating the value of a peering link. And finally, I'll conclude by uh, trying to study some of the global effects of what, what you would likely to uh, see in the, in the global internet if everyone were to do uh, some sort of value-based peering. So what we see actually um, in the real world, at least from looking at um, peering rules or peering requirements online, is this laundry list of conditions that networks seem to specify uh, as requirements for mostly for settlement-free peering. And some of these are things like uh, traffic ratios, minimum traffic requirements, backbone capacities, uh, the geographical spread that networks have to uh, sort of maintain, and so on. Uh, and what it looks like is that these are heuristics, really, to try to find the right set of networks uh, in which, with which it makes sense to uh, exchange traffic for free. And I put free in quotes because, of course, even settlement-free pairing incurs some, some amount of cost. But when it comes to paid pairing, uh, it, it gets a bit, little bit murkier. What is, what is the right price in this case? So a price is going to be exchanged on the link. What is this right price and which network should be paying the other network? Further, these sort of uh, peering requirements, uh, like I said, which are, which look like heuristics, are they always applicable? For example, it seems that many, uh, many times, because of these requirements, some links that are mu mutually beneficial might actually not get formed. And um, this seems like, this seems problematic. So um, what we propose is this method of pairing called value-based pairing. So we assume that this is not necessarily a settlement-free uh, pairing link. You can have a price being exchanged on this link. And the price should depend on the value of the link to, uh, to both of these pairing parties. So, so what is this value? Uh, for a network, let's say we define a notion of fitness. And here I talk about fitness in, in economic terms. So for, an, for a network that's, say, an ISP, you, it has a revenue, it incurs some costs, uh, and these costs are interconnect costs to connect to its, trans its own transit providers or to other settlement free peers, and it incurs a cost, a backhaul cost to route traffic on its own network. So the fitness is simply the revenue minus the interconnect minus the backhaul costs. And now suppose you have a certain fitness with the pairing link and you have a certain fitness without the pairing link. It's very simple that the value of the link to this network is simply the difference of these two uh, fitnesses. And the important thing to note is that um, in the case that you have the link and you don't have the link, all three of these terms that contribute to fitness could actually uh, change. So I'll go into that in a little bit of uh, detail here. So let's take this uh, example of two networks, A and B. They're currently not peers. They're uh, exchanging traffic via this transit provider, T. So uh, let's consider the first case that uh, like I said, they're exchanging traffic through this transit provider, so they both pay the transit provider. And um, when they actually try to form a peering link, this traffic is going to bypass the transit provider. So clearly, they've saved this amount of uh, they saved some amount of transit costs. Now you also notice that when traffic shifts from the transit provider to this uh, direct peering link, uh, the, the traffic flow inside each network also changes. So this probably also um, changes the backhaul costs that both A and B are now incurring. Finally, um, 
due to the formation of this peering link, traffic could be diverted such that the revenue for one of these, one or both of these networks could actually change. So let's see how that could happen. Suppose you have a network that's downstream of A somewhere in its customer cone, and initially when there's no peering link, it's routing traffic that actually eventually reaches B, but it doesn't uh, cross A at all. Now suppose that A and B actually peer. This network that's downstream of A now sees a shorter path and starts routing traffic through A. Now, since this is a customer, um, I hope that A is going to get paid for this traffic. And so actually, its revenue might actually increase. So uh, essentially, what I showed here is that all the three terms that contribute to the fitness of uh, a network could actually change uh, depending on whether a link, a peering link in this case, is present or not. So uh, suppose you have uh, an oracle or a third party or a mediator that knows the value of the link for A and B, for both A and B. So A and B have actually uh, diverged this information to the oracle. Now the oracle must decide what sort of price uh, should be exchanged on this link. And the, if you think about it, the fair price, if the value for, of the link for A is V of A and the value for B is VB, then the fair price is simply half of the difference between um, VA and VB. So the oracle would say that these networks should peer, and A should be paying B half of the difference. I assume here for simplicity that the value of A is greater than the value of B. So the direction of payment is from A to B. And it's not hard to see that uh, this price is fair in the sense that it equalizes the benefit that both uh, A and B are going to see from the link. Okay, so you, there is this notion of there is this fair price that would equalize the benefit uh, for both networks. But why would uh, these two networks actually agree to peer at this uh, price? So what we show in, the, in, this, in this paper actually is that peering with the fair price is optimal in the sense that both networks would actually see better fitness by peering at this price, peering and exchanging this price um, as opposed to the case where they don't peer at all. Further, we show that uh, this fair price actually lies in a region which, in which it is stable. So it is a unique Nash equilibrium in, this, in the sense that uh, no network has the incentive to unilaterally depeer the other network. So once uh, these two networks form the peering link and exchange the price, they don't have to worry about whether one of them should be trying to depeer the other or not. Um, uh, of course, uh, an important condition for the optimality and stability to hold is that the aggregate value of the link, so VA plus VB, has to be greater than zero. Uh, and this will, I'll bring this up again later because it turns out to be important. But note that the aggregate value VA plus VB has to be greater than zero, but this doesn't imply that both VA and VB have to be positive. Um, so contrast this with, say, cost-benefit pairing, where both networks are trying to pair only if it makes uh, sense for them, in which case both VA and VB have to be greater than zero. So uh, what does it mean to have, say, negative pairing value, and why would networks uh, still continue to pair even if they have negative pairing value? So let's take a simple example here, and I'm just going to throw out some hypothetical numbers. So let's consider networks A and B. They currently don't have uh, any peering link. And the fitness of A is um, this hypothetical number, 50K. And the fitness of B is 100K. Now suppose they actually form this peering link. The fitness of A might increase and go to 60K, while the fitness of B might decrease and go to 95K. What this implies is that the value of A for this pairing link is uh, 10K, and the value of B, it's negative, it's minus 5K. So what our fair pairing proposal would uh, suggest here is that since the value of A is greater than the value of B, these two networks should pair, and A should exchange half of the difference. In this case, that's 7.5K. Now, if you look, up, look at this, what happens is after this uh, payment has been exchanged, the Fitness of A is going to go to 52 and a half, and the fitness of B is going to go to 102 and a half. And if you look at what the fitnesses were before the pairing link existed, both are doing better now. So it's clear that even though one network was actually had a negative value for the pairing link, these two networks should actually be pairing and exchanging this price, and it's and they're both better off in this case. So uh, I. So far, I talked in very abstract terms about these values A and B, uh, V A and V B. But how do these networks actually go about measuring these values? How do you come up with V A and V B? So let's assume that you have uh, peering trials, and 
uh, initially there's no, no pairing link, but these two networks say temporarily set up a pairing link. And during the course of this pairing uh, trial, they collect various types of data, like net flow data and routing data and so on. And presumably they know their own topology, they know their own cost structures, they know who their transit providers are and how much they're charging them. So it's, it's reasonable to assume that with pairing trials, A and B can actually uh, measure their own value for the pairing link reasonably well. But it's going to be pretty hard for A to accurately measure the value of the other network. So A is going to not be able to measure VB very accurately, and vice versa. So given that a network can't actually uh, estimate the value for the other network, is that, let's, let's try to see if there's any value in a network trying to understate or hide its peering value. So let's take another simple example here. Uh, assume that the true total value of this link, VA, and v, VA plus VB, is positive. So this link is actually feasible, and it would be stable and optimal and so on. And for simplicity, let's assume that VB is greater than VA. So B gains more from this link than A. And according to our uh, fair um, price, a should be getting paid VB minus VA by 2. Now, let's say that A has a good estimate of how much the, the link means for B. And it tries to understate or hide its peering value. It gets greedy. And it claims its peering value is VL, where VL is much, much less than, say, VA. Uh, now, if B actually buys this and uh, agrees with this uh, claim, then B is going to be willing to pay more. It's going to pay VB minus VL by 2. And A is going to be very happy. It's, it's essentially, it's, uh, it's cheated in some sense. But the important condition here is that uh, A has to have an accurate estimate of B's value. And if it doesn't do this well, and the aggregate value, uh, now VL plus VB, becomes negative, then this peering link is not going to be feasible anymore. Because like I said earlier, uh, for the peering link to be stable, the, the aggregate value of the link has to be positive. So. In this case, by trying to cheat, A is going to actually lose out on any sort of payment at all. And the question uh, that raises is that, does this ri risk of losing out on all payment actually create some sort of incentive in trying to, in disclosing the true value for peering links? So uh, all of this raises some pretty hard questions, and uh, I don't have the answers to all of them. I hope some of you will be able to help me answer them. So the first and foremost thing is, I propose this thing, this price which is fair and optimal and stable, but is there actually an incentive to be fair in the real world? If, if not, then, uh, yeah, then I don't know. Um, the second, can, can a network actually try to estimate its own value for a pairing link without undergoing this whole process of uh, setting up the pairing link, going through pairing trials, collecting loads and loads of data and so on? And uh, this is something actually where uh, working on right now, we have a, a, an ongoing project, and uh, perhaps at the next, next NANOG, I might have some results. Um, the third thing is, can a network uh, estimate the value of a pairing link for a potential or, or even a current peer? And um, thinking about it, this seems really hard, and I, I don't know if there's even any hope for a network to try to accurately estimate uh, how much the other network benefits from a peering link. And lastly, uh, something that we are interested in, what are the sort of global effects of uh, value-based peering? What if everyone in the Internet was trying to peer in this way? And, and what would happen to uh, various uh, global metrics? So the last thing is something that, again, we are working on, and I will present some uh, uh, early results from, from there. So um, uh, like I said, we would like to sort of study what are the global effects of value-based peering. And clearly, for, for this sort of thing, we need a model. We need a model for essentially the entire Internet ecosystem. And this is exactly what we are trying to, trying to build here. So uh, as presumably networks are trying to select the providers and peers to optimize a certain objective function, right? And this objective function is probably different for every network out there. So for a transit provider, it should be profit. For a content provider, it might be performance. For a stub network at the edge, it might simply be minimizing costs. So what we're interested in is what are the effects of these sort of uh, provider and peer selection strategies on the, on the networks that actually do these things. Further, what are the effects of these strategies on the, on the global Internet as a whole? So in the sense of how does a topology look like when everyone does this? How does traffic flow? Uh, what, what are the economics like? Which providers make money? Which providers lose money? And uh, how does performance look like in terms of end-to-end -end path length, say? And 
uh, some sort of questions that we would try to answer was, can we predict what would happen if, say, everyone in the internet was trying to do fair uh, paid peering? So our approach to trying to answer these sort of uh, what-if questions is through this, this model, which we call ITER. And what this is is essentially uh, an agent-based model that tries to answer these sort of what-if questions about internet evolution. And it has, I mean, it's a highly parameterized model. So we have various inputs which we try to parameterize according to the best data we have available. Um, so we have different types of networks. We have transit providers. We model content providers, stubs. We model different peer and provider selection strategies for each of these networks. We model the presence of geographical constraints. We have pricing and cost parameters. And uh, we, have an, so we model an, some sort of estimate of the interdomain traffic matrix. And given all these inputs, what this model essentially splits out is an equilibrium internetwork. So we have an, uh, an internetwork topology. We have how the traffic flows on this um, uh, topology. And this gives us per network uh, fitness in terms of um, economics. So the way uh, we actually come up with um, this equilibrium is as follows. And uh, unfortunately, I can't point here. But so essentially, you start with this interdomain topology, which is the leftmost block there. That, together with the traffic matrix and routing policies, are going to determine how traffic actually flows in the internet. Now, traffic flow is going to determine per uh, network fitness, in the sense uh, which providers make how much money, how much cost they incur, and so on. Uh, networks are going to try to optimize their fitness or minimize their costs or whatever by appropriately choosing their providers and peers. This process feeds back into the topology because the topology changes when someone changes their providers or peers. And this process keeps repeating, uh, essentially until we reach a state where no network has any incentive to uh, make any further changes in its connectivity. And this is, this is the equilibrium. And once we've actually computed this equilibrium iteratively, which is why we call this model ITER, um, we can measure the topological and economic properties of this resulting equilibrium. And we can measure things like how do the path lengths look like. We can measure economics, which uh, providers seem to be profitable, which networks tend to peer with which other networks, and so on. So what we did was actually uh, used this model, this we, this, we built a simulator for this model, and we used it to simulate value-based peering, among many other things. So uh, unfortunately, this model is pretty computationally expensive. So we can't run it at the scale of the internet, not at the scale of 34,000 ASs, for sure. But we, we have a small but realistic internet network topology, and we can model different types of networks, transit providers, content providers, and stubs. Um, we parameterize an interdomain traffic matrix, which currently, in the current version of the model, is, is dominated by traffic that flows from content providers to stubs. We model various different provider selection methods, but uh, eventually we stuck with just price-based provider selection. So everyone chooses the cheapest providers. We model various peer selection uh, methods, one of them which is the one which I just presented. The other one is cost-benefit based peering, where two networks peer only if they both see a benefit from the link, and this well-known traffic ratio based peering. And we also parameterize the transit and peering pricing according to whatever data we were able to uh, find. So what happens when we actually simulate uh, this value based peering in uh, using this model? What we find is that compared to cost benefit or traffic ratio based peering, you'll see a much higher density of peering links uh, when everyone is doing value based peering. And this is actually not very hard to see why. I mean, links that are not allowed with uh, traffic ratio or cost benefit peering actually become possible with value-based peering, because simply because uh, a payment can now be exchanged. In terms of payment direction, uh, we studied in the equilibrium network which networks tend to pay which other networks. And we found that these, it, the interesting thing we found was that content providers can be on both sides of this uh, paid peering relationship. Sometimes they end up paying uh, typically the larger transit providers, while they actually get paid by smaller transit providers. And I'd be very interested to uh, talk with folks here and see if you have insights about whether this is happening already in the internet. And finally, like I said, um, incorrect estimation of the pairing value, especially for the other network, can actually uh, preclude the formation of uh, links that would be mutually beneficial. So again, there's an incentive to try to uh, share the 
correct value for the uh, peering link with the potential peer. So needless to say, we need feedback on, um, on this particular model, on this value-based uh, framework which I proposed, and some, of, some examples on how you might be able to help us. So for example, how much foresight goes into provider and peer selection decisions? So uh, does, while trying to form a peering relationship, does a network actually think what its customers would do, how its customers might uh, change their routing, uh, change the traffic, and so on? Uh, again, insights about how paid peering negotiations happen in the real world uh, would definitely help us uh, inform this model much better. And finally, about this last piece, this ITER model that I presented, uh, like I said, it's a highly parameterized model. The, the, the Whether or not the output makes sense depends to a large extent on whether the input is realistic. So uh, we're, we're looking to, if, if you would be willing to share data with us to help us parameterize this model better, that would be uh, awesome. And the kind of data that might be very useful to us is any sort of traffic data or pricing or cost parameters or things like that. Um, so that's pretty much it. Thanks for listening. And um, you can find more details in, in, the, uh, in the actual paper. And please feel free to email me or my co-authors for copies of uh, these papers or feedback, criticism, anything. Thanks uh, very much. So I think we have time for one quick question if somebody wants to go up. Hi, I'm Nina from uh, TDC. Um, I was just wondering if, um, first of all, I really like your model. Thank you for doing it. I've been looking for people who would do this for a couple of years. Thank you. I have no idea what game theory is about, but I have peering as my day job. Um, and we would love to share our data with you, by the way. Okay. Uh, what I wonder is, do you see that this model could, you know, turn into something operational for somebody like me? Or is it more uh, a, a view of the whole peering ecosystem so we can all have just an idea of what happens globally, but not for my own little network? So let me, let me add a little bit to that question. Uh, I guess one other thing I was wondering was, is this something you see as a one-time thing which people do, or is this an ongoing process which you can use? Um, right. So uh, to answer your question first, uh, if you look at the second uh, point here, right, uh, one thing that we're working on is uh, a sort of a broader thing called uh, like a cost model that uh, networks could use to try to um, uh, come up, try to determine peering value for um, uh, potential or current peering links. And this is, this I think could be uh, very useful for sort of day-to-day the operations of an ISP and trying to determine costs and trying to find the right set of peers. As far as your uh, other question about this, this sort of model, uh, I believe it has sort of more general utility in the sense that uh, uh, it, it, it can help, okay, how should I put it? It, it can help us sort of um, try to predict what's, going, what's likely to happen if, if uh, players in this ecosystem are going to do things in a certain way. So it, it, I think it can help in sort of long-term strategizing about provider and peer selection um, decisions. But uh, I mean, the role of this model is not to sort of predict which sort of exact network you should go and peer with. But uh, given a certain class of peering policies that you have, trying to predict what's, what's likely to be your fate, essentially. So Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Samuk. Uh, next, we have Cassie uh, presenting some really interesting work on DNSSEC visualization. Uh, I personally was looking forward to this talk as well. And uh, uh, people who are at the back rows, you might have a slight problem looking at some of the screenshots. So if you're really interested in, uh, and scared about DNSSEC, I would encourage you to come up a little bit. OK. So let's see. Let's get this through. Uh, which one is your DNSSEC, right? This one. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. If I would have known a little bit more about the uh, research forum and um, seen Mohit's slide a ahead of time, I would have uh, biased my slides a little bit more, but uh, here we are. So I'll go ahead and go forward. <clears throat> so has anyone tried DNSSEC yet? Anyone signed their zones? Anyone validate anyone else's zones? Good. 
Any of you experience any problems? Oh, good. Okay. So there will be a few people listening then. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, so this will be interesting. So um, part of the motivation for this came earlier in the, uh, in the year. We, started to, we decided to follow the lead of some of the others that were actually doing validation. Um, we had signed our zones in uh, fall of last year at sandia.gov and, um, and decided to follow the lead of some others in actually doing some validation. But I set it up in such a way that uh, we could actually be getting data for the uh, responses that were failing. And w I was surprised at the uh, number of failures that had come in the first couple weeks of this. And uh, as we troubleshot these, we realized that uh, the symptoms and the, and the causes were all over the map. I mean, it wasn't just consistently uh, expired signatures or um, or uh, DNS keys missing or something like that. It was it was really uh, pretty crazy. And so, um, in uh, some of the research I was doing, I decided to uh, integrate a tool to do some visualization to help administrators understand what was going on and to diagnose particular problems that were happening. So, uh, ah, the good old days, right? We do a, um, a dig and we get back a, a nice response. It's, fairly concise, and we can read it. Uh, we add in DNSSEC, and we get a lot more data, um, a lot of it which we can't do much with with our eye, um, and we need tools to actually uh, do something reasonable with it. Uh, the one thing that we can, as a, at least as a sub-resolver, uh, do is if our we can use this um, authenticated data bit, the AD bit that's set here, uh, to let us know that the resolver uh, was able to validate it. So. Um, uh, but with the rest of it, uh, you know, we just kind of have to take for granted, at least with our naked eye. Okay, but what happens when something goes wrong? Uh, that's where it becomes fairly problematic because what we get is a serve fail message, uh, which could be DNSSEC related. It could be some other uh, name resolution error that we come across. Okay, so if we take this particular example, that's, uh, this is from www.medicare.gov back in April, and... Uh, we pull out our handy uh, troubleshooting tool, DIG, and we might uh, carefully craft a few well-directed queries and get something like the following, from which, uh, if we look through the numbers I've highlighted, some of which might be handy, uh, we might deduce that uh, the problem is that um, the DS is referencing a key that does not exist, and therefore our chain of trust is broken. Uh, fairly straightforward, right? Uh, but quite of information, uh, pardon the pun, to dig through. So uh, one of the other difficult things in looking at this is uh, that there are some attributes that are associated with DNS keys, but in the real world, these are not always uh, the typical case that we might find, which is illustrated here in this graphic, uh, where you have a single zone signing key, a key signing key, which also acts as the SEP. Okay, and even in, uh, in the case of revocation, uh, we see cases where um, they don't always follow the pattern. In other words, the revoke bit is is set, uh, but not necessarily self-signed, which uh, per RFC 5011 uh, means that it isn't fully uh, validated as revoked, okay? Um, so a few things to consider as we begin our uh, DNSSEC troubleshooting journey. Um, now, there are some other tools out there. I've just only put a few uh, extensions here to, um, uh, well, built into dig, um, or extension to dig, a SIG chase, and then uh, built into drill um, are some methods. These are uh, good methods and very powerful, um, but uh, also textual and uh, more catered towards advanced users. Okay, so on to uh, visualization. Okay, um, the tool is available online at dnsviz.net, and uh, this is a little bit of a screenshot. Okay, so to show a little bit about some of the components that are in use for this, uh, for those that haven't seen this, basically constructing an authentication graph with nodes and directed edges. And uh, here are some of the meanings of some of those nodes. So we have domain names, um, DNS key, and D, uh, DS resource records, which are shown um, with an elliptical-shaped node. Uh, and then the nodes are decorated based on their attributes. Okay, so if the set bit is set, for example, it's filled in with gray. If the revoke bit is set, uh, you're gonna have a, um, a darker shade, uh, shaded border. Uh, if it's published only, um, then you've got a dash line, dash border. Uh, if it's missing altogether but referenced somewhere, it's going to be uh, red uh, fill. And then if it's, a, if it's acting as a trust anchor, which I'll show you in just a moment, uh, then it's going to be, have a uh, double border. And then finally, um, 
this is a, just to explain this, this insect type uh, node, uh, this diamond shaped node. This is for, uh, for zones that are signed uh, but have insecure delegations. Uh, this particular node is used uh, to represent the NSEC um, one or in some cases two that repudiate the existence of DS type resource records which effectively uh, prove that it's an insecure delegation. Um, so now here where we put in the uh, relationships between these particular nodes, okay, so we have uh, alias dependencies show up here. Um, signatures or digests are directed edges between nodes, and uh, the color represents the status of the signature or digest, so whether it's valid, bogus, or expired. Okay. Uh, we're also overlaying the uh, zones on top of these other nodes, the DNS keys and, and uh, other resource records, and I'll show you how that goes. But uh, in between the two, the different zones, um, the delegations are represented as either secure, broken, insecure, or misconfigured. And then finally, um, with regard to the insect type nodes that I explained earlier, um, the nodes going into those uh, show if it's uh, – the color shows whether it's an effective or ineffective proof of insecure delegation. Okay, and then the bottom line is the outline of the actual node in the graph itself, which is going to tell us uh, whether something is uh, secure, bogus, or insecure based on tracing it from the trust anchor down uh, going through the various um, DNSSEC rules. Okay, so we revisit our previous example, uh, Medicare.gov, and uh, we confirm our suspicions that, in fact, uh, there is a DS-type resource record for Medicare.gov, but it does not uh, match up with any uh, DNS key, uh, which now, if you can follow, I'll show you a couple things on this while I have it up. Um, if, I, if I can get the pointer. Can you see it? Okay. So up here at the top is the uh, trust anchor. Um, which by default I'm, a, I'm actually anchoring with the uh, ISC uh, DLV trust um, I, DLV service, and then uh, that gets traced down here. So you can see all these are trusted until this point, at which point these nodes down here in the Medicare.gov zone are in fact uh, broken. Okay. Um, now there are some options in the DNS Viz web-based tool uh, to change things around. So over um, in the there's a pull-down menu which you can actually change the supported algorithms um, as well as put in your own trust anchor. So in this case, you'll see that the, um, the visualization actually changes when we only support algorithms 1 and, and uh, 5 here. Um, and, and in fact, this changes things to an insecure result because uh, the, the DNS keys in the .gov zone are algorithm type 7, which is uh, now unsupported according to this. So. Um, and then we see what happens if we were to change uh, the trust anchors, if we don't anchor with DLV anymore, and uh, we add our own trust anchor to Medicare.gov, things look just fine, even though it's broken above Medicare.gov because we've changed the view a little bit. So this kind of shows how you can play with things a little bit depending on your own view, uh, if you'd like to get a little bit um, uh, more specific or, or flexible. Okay, so um, I'd like to run through a few more examples, and I haven't taken any provisions to anonymize any of this data, um, so uh, just uh, for, for reference. Okay, so here's an example of a, uh, uh, again, I talked about these DNS key roles that we might typically see, so I'm just showing some various examples of how things show up here. So in this particular case, uh, this zone, the .new zone, is signed with a, a single key, which is uh, functioning both as the uh, ZSK, the KSK, and also the SEP because it uh, provides secure entry from uh, ISC's DLV. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, this is another example. Uh, there are two keys here, but in fact, both of these are registered, which is perfectly legitimate um, as, uh, as secure entry points into this zone, which is uh, fedorahosted.org. And you can see um, going into the .org zone, um, that uh, it, it, .org uh, makes this, I'm going to say, repudiates, proves that it's a, an insecure delegation. Um, but, uh, of course, you have the, um, the delegation, if you will, into the ISC DLV, the look aside service. Okay. Um, one thing I didn't mention is up at the top, you can see the DERS uh, for the root, which, of course, shows uh, bogus signatures. Okay. Um, 
This is an example of something we've seen where uh, on different servers, authoritative servers for a particular zone, you actually get different results. Uh, I'm not sure what the cause of this particular one is. I have a feeling it's a load balancer because we've seen several of those. Um, but one of them is actually, one of the servers serves a bogus signature. The other one is legitimate, um, which is uh, very interesting, even though they both, uh, both servers are serving the same serial. Uh, here's another example, um, and this one is similar, except uh, that the uh, one of them is serving an expired result. And I, I have a feeling that this is probably because uh, they might be using one of the tools, um, such as DNSX sign zone, but maybe didn't increment their serial. The secondary never pulled it down. Just a guess. I don't have any confirmation on that. Um, but it's just to give the administrator an idea that, hey, one of your servers is serving bad data. Um, Okay, so here's an example of what a uh, revoked DNS key looks like. So you can see by the dark outline that the revoke bit is set, and then there's a uh, self-loop on the um, key itself to show that it's, that it's uh, also signed in the DNS key resource record set. Um, so this one uh, came out, what, last weekend, um, uh, about a week and a half ago, dot .arpa. Um, the signature expired, as you can see here, and the repercussions are shown in that uh, from the key where the missing signature um, takes place up at the top there uh, on down, it affects the zones below it uh, because following the chain down now, the uh, NSEC record is no longer valid, which means that even the unsigned zones below it were affected by this. Now, unless there was some other anchor down below, which is the case of some zones, um, this is an example of, of how this um, goes down the graph uh, to, to show what is affected. Okay, here's another example of expired signatures, but in this particular case, uh, this is in an island of security, so it really didn't affect uh, anything in terms of security. Um, here's one where the signatures, uh, the keys exist, but the signatures for some reason do not exist. Um, this is an interesting example. Things to show, uh, a couple things to show here. Uh, this is the result of a um, key, uh, key signing key rollover that went bad. Um, but uh, first of all, um, I've developed things such that uh, DNS viz will map the um, DNS key with the revoke bit set to the DS records pre-revoke bit, just to give the administrator an idea of where uh, this this new um, key tag came from so they can have an idea, okay, that's, this is a bad rollover or something like that, uh, which is the case here. Uh, also notice I mentioned the example of a revoke bit uh, being set without a self-signature. Uh, this is an example of that, and um, uh, I've seen um, at least one appliance actually doing this. Um, so this was interesting. Uh, this just uh, shows a little bit of... Um, dependency complexities, how complex this can get in troubleshooting this. And this is precisely the reason why I was uh, developing something like this, so you can get a grasp of the entire picture of, of things. I know this is hard to read from the back, um, but uh, basically it shows an alias dependency. The, the domain that we were getting failures on, or the name we were getting failures on, was www.cmms.hhs.gov, which actually doesn't have any DNSSEC problems. In fact, it isn't even anchored. Uh, the problem was it aliased another name that was anchored and had DNSSEC problems. Of course, that name, alias, is another name and another name, um, which didn't have problems, but the fact that it was somewhere in the alias chain of what made all this have, uh, have di difficulties. Okay, just a couple other things that, uh, that the tool currently does. Um, it checks consistency, which I already showed an example of that. It checks uh, PMTU uh, on the server side of things. Um, it also checks NSEC3 awareness. We have a number of uh, different zones that are NSEC3 signed, and uh, one or more of the servers um, are not um, NSEC3 capable. Uh, which, of, of course, affects uh, insecure delegations. So some of the things I'm planning to do for this uh, in the future, one, first of all, it's not documented very well. Uh, Mohit uh, talked about undocumented scripts. This is one of them. Um, but uh, hopefully I'll be able to put some more on that fairly soon. Uh, I also intend to do a history so that administrators can see what, uh, what their zone has looked like, not only what it looks like currently. Um, and then... Uh, do some regular polling um, and alert services to administrators, and then finally uh, 
some kind of a RESTful interface so that somebody could potentially uh, query the server and, and uh, ask it questions periodically. Any questions for me? All right, so we have, we have time for a couple of questions or maybe one question if anybody has questions. Uh, Michael Sinatra, UC Berkeley. I just want to say thanks for doing this. This was a big help to a lot of us in um, not only do, diagnosing our own problems, but also helping other people diagnose problems. And it's been very useful. So thanks a lot for doing it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Kevin Oberman, ESNet. Uh, first of all, thanks for giving me the heads up so that I could raise my hand when you asked if we'd had problems with DNSSEC before you put the example up there, <laughs> demonstrating our problem. And that was an appliance uh, problem. And it actually only was sort of an appliance problem. The problem had been fixed before I had my KSK rollover. It never should have happened, except our spam filter decided to start uh, filtering all of the notifications of software updates from the vendor of the appliance. So I didn't update my software. <laughs> Thank you. I've actually seen a couple of their zones that had that same problem. They must have also had the same spam filters. <laughs> we have uh, Lucas from UCLA. Okay. So Lucas, Lucas is going to talk about uh, another visualization uh, tool. This is IP. This is for uh, IP address allocation, and it's uh, a lot of interesting results as well. So let's see. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lucas Wang from Internet Research Lab, UCLA. Uh, today I'm going to introduce to you a monitoring tool called IP that is used to visualize IPv4 address allocation and their usage in global BGP routing tables. And this is joint work with Ricardo Oliveira, who is working in Southern Ice, and um, Professor Lisha Zhang. So um, uh, I would be more than happy to take questions or feedback during, uh, during this presentation. So please don't hesitate to go to the microphone and ask our questions. Um, so what is the problem? Um, as we all know, we are giving out of the IPv4 addresses, and um, um, we have given many of them to the um, organizations or end users. But the relationship between address allocation and the prefix announcement is still not very clear. Um, for instance, we would like to ask the questions like, um, are the prefixes announced in the same size as they are allocated? Or um, are all the allocated prefixes announced? I'm sure many of you know that the answer is no, but I would like to use this tool to help you understand where are these allocated but unannounced prefixes. And uh, on the update side, we want to ask, are any unallocated prefixes announced in, in BGP? Or um, or if, if so, for, for how long time has these prefixes been announced? This question sounds more interesting because we may wonder why would anybody announce prefixes that do not belong to them? Um, so the motivation for this tool um, comes from the huge amount of data. So we, in order to answer these questions, actually different factors of data need to be correlated together. And uh, the amount of data is so huge that it is not quite feasible for a human to jump uh, back and forth between the large amount of data. And uh, um, for some network operators, if you are only interested uh, in a small, in a specific IP range, it would be um, a little bit difficult to fit, to extract the allocations or prefixes within this range from from the large allocation database or large uh, routing table. So, so um, this tool would help you to get not only the, the big picture of what's happening uh, within the entire IPv4 address space in terms of allocation and the prefix announcement, but also enables you to drill down into specific IP, IP range that you are interested in. So what IP can help you with is to provide you a comprehensive picture of what's going on 
in the entire IPv4 address space in terms of allocation and uh, prefix announcement. And um, it also gives you very clear a picture regarding the relationship between allocation and, and announcement. Um, like, like, like I just said, um, you, you would be able to see very e easily um, the allocated but not, uh, but not observed prefixes in the default free zone. And uh, you will also see some cases where uh, the address announced into BGP, but they're not actually allocated to, according to the allocation database. And, uh, but for majority of the addresses, they are allocated and announced, but they're announced in many different forms. What I mean by, by different forms is that um, some, for some cases, you have, you have a, um, a very big covering prefix, and uh, you have um, some smaller covered prefix within it, and you have more specific covered prefix in it, and all the way down to very specific um, prefix, this could be, I mean, it's kind of like a tree. This tree could be very deep, and uh, it will be interesting to capture um, some, some cases um, to, uh, I mean, it will be interesting to see how people utilize their uh, address inside the BGP routing tables. So the data source we use include uh, Hui's database from all the file RARs, and uh, we use the allocation, rec um, allocation records published by RARs, uh, which is actually allocation snapshots um, ever, since, ever since February uh, 2005. And we use a routing snapshots collected by both road views and RIPE monitors. So this is the first scene of the website IP. And uh, on the left up corner, um, as you can see, our, our data is updated on a daily basis. And uh, here are two check boxes for you to um, visualize the data you are interested in. It could be either allocation or prefix announcement. And there are several fields here for you to do, to do a search based on uh, the IP range or organization name or uh, origin AS number. So below the navigation bar is um, this picture shows the allocation status in the entire IPv4 address space. It's divided into um, eight lines, and uh, each line represents 32 slash 8 address block. And um, here is, the, is uh, the traditional class E address chunk that's reserved by IANA for future use. And uh, these dark, uh, dark gray blocks represent the unallocated slash 8 blocks that still remains in IANA's hand. As you can see, we have 16 of them here. And uh, these um, seen rectangles um, represent the, the legacy uh, blocks which were uh, allocated out uh, even before the RIR system was established. And um, here is the multicast address chunk. And uh, these rectangles with red edges represent slash 8 um, address blocks under administration of Erin, and uh, the blue ones are the slash eight blocks managed by RIPE, and the green ones by APINIC, black ones by LACNIC, and uh, purple ones by AFRINIC. Um, so this is, this is the allocation status of the entire IPv4 address space um, in the granularity of slash eight. Um, as we all know, after the RIRs get uh, where it gets the, uh, a big chunk of slash eight address, it would give out smaller um, sub allocations to the ISPs in its region. Um, so this is how I visualize the sub allocations. As you can see, this um, the the whole thing is a slash eight address block, and at the beginning we have slash even. Uh, I, I mean, at the at the Beginning, we have a slash 11 uh, sub allocation. So uh, it's shown as a, because this sub allocation was issued by Aaron, so I use a red, co red color here to, re to 
show this allocation block. And uh, in the middle, we have slash 10 uh, sub allocation and, uh, and also a slash, slash non allocation in the end. Uh, what's interesting here is that a, a, a tiny portion of address within the slash 8 block um, was actually transferred to RIPE. It's allocated to some organization in Europe. Um, so I use both different color and height to represent um, the sub allocations managed by different RIRs. And uh, if we want to, we want to visualize um, multiple slash eight uh, blocks uh, and uh, sub allocations within one figure. I mean, th this whole picture would be shrinked into um, the cell here in the bottom, and uh, the sub allocation uh, rectangles. Uh, would appear like uh, bars. So here is um, the, the, in, the allocation status, um, including both allocation in the granularity of slash 8 and sub allocations for the entire IPv4 address space. Um, yeah, I think uh, in terms of allocation, these kind of figures um, is, is very clear. But um, as you have might noticed that uh, this picture is is kind of messy, and uh, for for some of, for those of you who who are only interested in a specific IP range, you uh, you would want to drill down into the into the specific range, and uh, so I implemented the zooming in and zooming out feature on on this picture so that you can just click in. Uh, in the in the following slide, I will show you the the, the more detailed allocation. Um, within 24 slash 8 and the 1 slash 8 as well as 193 slash 8. So this is the, the, the real allocation status within 24 slash 8. As I said before, these um, uh, red rectangles here are the sub allocations issued by Aaron. And uh, this uh, little, uh, little portion here would uh, transfer to RIPE. And uh, this slide, the second row shows the sub allocation within 193 slash 8. And uh, as you can see here, a majority of the sub allocations were allocated to organizations in Europe. And we have a bunch of them transferred to Afrinic. And uh, the bottom line here shows um, the allocation status within the, um, within 1 slash 8, which was given to Afrinic at the at the um, at the beginning of this year, and uh, after the organization got um, address address blocks, they would announce the address in uh, in BGP routing tables. So this is one way to turn your address into prefixes. Um, as you can see here, at at the top of this reverse tower, we have a um, slash eleven prefix announcement. And it also has uh, slash 12 children prefix at the first half of it announced in BGP. And it also has seven levels of covered prefix announcement. So it would be interesting to capture these cases. And uh, if we combine the allocation and uh, uh, prefix announcement into one picture here, um, um, the allocation blocks are are drawn above the axis, and the prefix announcement are drawn um, are painted under the axis. So at the beginning of um, 97 slash 8 is actually a slash 10 allocation, and uh, in routing table there there is a prefix that has exactly the same size as the allocation, and it also has 38 children prefixes. Um, so this, um, I, I, I think I have done with um, how the tool works. Um, I would be more than happy if you could provide some feedback and how would you like to use this tool. And uh, in, the, in the following, uh, I mean, in the rest of this presentation, I would give some uh, measurement results regarding the allocated but not announced uh, addresses and uh, the reverse. Uh, the reverse part. Um, so here, here, this picture shows the number of allocated but unannounced address blocks. Um, uh, so, um, um, 
So on the, on the side, as you can see, Swisscom announced a long list of um, slash eight prefixes that do not belong to them. Um, somewhere, somewhere between November 28th and December 5th, 2006. And, uh, and before the announcement, we have, we have a lot of um, small allocations that do not appear in BGP. But um, after the announcement, these small, small allocations were masked. So there, there's a big jump in, in the curve. Um, and uh, Swisscom withdrew the, these, um, the list of slash eight prefixes at the end of July 2009. So the curve remain, um, returned back to its previous level, which is around, um, which is around um, 28,000 entries of allocated but unannounced address uh, blocks. And uh, I, I also want to measure the, the amount of address that falls in this category. Uh, so I, um, let's say in this example we have, um, we have um, two slash 22 address blocks and the one uh, slash 21 address block. They're, they're not necessarily contiguous to each other, but um, in terms of uh, measurement, I just combine them into one slash 20 and give the result here in this picture. As you can see, roughly we have around 25 slash eight um, amount of addresses that are allocated but not announced in, in routing tables. And and we want to, we want to see where where are these um, addresses. So, th I mean, this picture gives you how I um, how I would um, present uh, the addresses in this range, which is allocated but unannounced um, addresses. Um, so the y-axis here represents uh, the entire IPv4 address space. I would I would um, put each. Uh, I would put each address block into the corresponding position um, of, of the entire IPv4 address space. So in, in this way, um, you can see where are these allocated but unannounced, uh, unannounced addresses. Um, so here, as you can see, we, we, have, we have both addresses within the traditional class A and class B and class C addresses that are allocated but unannounced. And uh, on, on the reverse part, we also want to see the announced prefixes that are not allocated. Um, so this picture gives you the number of, of, of prefixes in, in this category. Um, so the, the y-axis y is just the number of prefixes. Um, as you can see, the the number of prefixes in this range is order is um, orders of magnitude less than the previous case, uh, which is um, for, mo for for most of the time it's um, it's below 2,500, and uh, the trend shows the number of prefixes in this range decreases as time goes by, and. Um, this picture gives you the amount of prefix, um, the, the amount of addresses in this in this category, and uh, we can also see that um, the amount of addresses in this range decreases recently, um, from from the end of 2009, and um, so. Who announced these um, prefixes that do not belong to them? Uh, this this picture um, shows shows the origin AS distribution uh, in time axis. So in the the y axis is the AS ID. It's not ac it's not actually one or two ASs announced the prefixes that do not belong to them. It's actually a bunch of a uh, bunch of ASs, as you can see here. Um, some some AS continuously doing this. Um, and uh, and uh, some AS here, 
mouse doesn't work. Okay, some some ES just uh, announced prefixes uh, for a very short period of time and uh, stops doing that. Um, so we captured several anom anomaly cases, and for instance, from July 12, 2005, to August the 2nd, 2005, um, AS 2905 just announced more than 50 slash 8 um, prefixes, and uh, the BGP the BGP monitor with this IP address captured this event. And uh, the second row, in the second row, the, um, pretty much the same thing happened again. The AS16215 announced more than 60 slash 8 prefixes that do not belong to it. And uh, actually, two monitors captured this event. And we have even more cases. So to wrap things up, um, IP is a tool that helps you not only manage the uh, allocation of addresses, but I think it's um, is pretty much the first to try to visualize the prefix tree structure in routing tables, and it, it helps us to understand the relationship between address allocation and their usage in routing tables. And uh, in terms of um, measurement results, um, uh, our result shows that around 25 slash 8 amount of um, allocated addresses are not are not visible in the default free zone and around 1 to 1.5 slash 8 amount of um, unallocated prefixes are observed by BGP monitors. And um, several monitors even, even captured a long list of slash 8 prefixes. That's it. Any questions? Okay, we have time for one quick question. And people can grab Lucas after the session. What's the significance of... Uh, address blocks not being available in the DFC. Like, why does that matter? Um, you mean the allocated but not announced? Yes. Um, this is just some measurement. Um, I, I know some, um, I mean, the address were, after the address were given out to the organizations, uh, they, um, I mean, they have dif different reasons not announcing them, they may they may be using them in, inside their own AS, so that's not observed in the default prism. So it's just a measurement thing for you. It's not about right. No conjectures to to why that may be. That's fine. Right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Lucas. <laughs> Next, we have Chang. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Chen Chen Hu from Tsinghua University, located in Beijing. And it's my first time to hear uh, in Nalog. And I'm pleased to give a talk uh, on evaluating potential routing diversity for internet failure recovery. This is a co work with Kai Chen and Yan Chen from Northwestern University, located in Chicago, and Bing Liu, also from Tsinghua University. As we know, uh, Internet has become an infrastructure of our information-based society. Any interruption to the Internet may uh, lead to significant economic and societal impacts. However, it is impossible to avoid the failures of Internet, uh, especially for the uh, real-world emergencies or disasters like the one uh, in a, like the earthquake in Haiti we talked about this morning. Here is an example about Taiwan earthquake hit on December 2006. During that event, uh, seven of nine cross-sea cables are, are, uh, are hit, uh, cut, and which caused a long duration, of, long duration of interruption of the Internet between 
U.S. and most of the Asian countries. There were still abandoned physical level connection, connectivity there, but it just took too long for ISPs to find them and use them. We can see from the figure on the bottom right corner of this page, we see that uh, there are still hundreds of nodes lost the connection uh, days after the event. So internet is not as reliable as people expected. There is a paper in Conex 2007 state that there are 32% ASs are vulner vulnerable to a single critical customer provider link card, and 93.7% tier one ISP single home customer are lost from the peer ISP due to tier one de-peering. So we have to ask, can we find more resources to increase the internet reliability, especially when internet emergency happens? The answer is, of course, yes. And I'd like to uh, introduce where are the potential resources in the second part of this presentation. To the best of our, uh, uh, not, uh, to the best of our acknowledgement, uh, we think there are at least uh, two kinds of resources can be used. The first resource is in the RXP. RXP is short for Internet Exchange Points, where the routers from multiple ASs uh, located in, and they exchange their traffic. But there are no mesh connection between all the ASs. So by adding a new BGP session, by adding a new BGP session between the victim AS and the survived AS, we can, uh, the victim AS can find more routing paths for recovery the connectivity during the emergency. The second, we think we can find the helpers from your peers. Different from the customer provider relationship and sibling uh, relationship, uh, an AS doesn't export its routing of its provider to the peers. If we relax the peering rules by allowing one AS to carry traffic from the, the peer to its provider, the victim AS can find more, uh, more routing paths to recover the connectivity. Uh, this measure is also mentioned in a previous paper, but they didn't have any evaluation on how much gain we can get from this measure. So that's our focus is how can we find, how can we get from these two potential resources? It's the fundamental uh, question we need to ask or to answer before we can, uh, we to think about how to use these resources. So that's the third part of this presentation. How much potential resources are there? To evaluate this problem, uh, we first generate a AS topology graph. To generate this uh, most complete AS topology graph up to date, we first collected BGP data from several uh, sources. For example, route views, right evidence, uh, Sonet BGP view. And we also collect uh, trace out, uh, P, uh, P2P trace out data from 992,000 IP addresses in over 3,700 ASs. And in total, there are 120,000 AS links with relationships in the top AS topology we generated. And you can find this topology uh, through this URL link in this page. Also, we uh, collect the RXP data from PCH, Peering DB, and EuroRx, which include more than 200 IXPs. And especially in our evaluation, we include 3,468 participant ASs. To study the, uh, the failure cases, uh, we classify the failures into 
three different categories. First is the peer link down, and the second is provider customer link tier down, and with the third, mixed types of links uh, break down. Due to the time limitation, I will only focus on the first failure model. And more results, please check out uh, to check our report. Uh, and the URL of this report is also listed in this uh, in this page, and you can check it from the Netlog website. Uh, during the evaluation, three metrics are studied. Uh, first is the recovery ratio, which is defined as the number of recovered source destination AS pairs versus total number of affected source destination AS pairs. Pass diversity, it is the number of increased link disjointed AS paths between affected source destination AS pairs. And we also studied the shifted paths. It is the number of link disjointed AS paths shifted onto a normal link after we use XP or PR resources. Here is a result for the experiment on deep hearing. In the worst case, there are two tier one ASs are deep heard. And we totally perform 36 experiments. In each experiment, two tier one ASs of nine uh, total are deep heard. And we can find in all the experiments that uh, the minimum recovery ratio we can achieve is about 30%, 33%. Second, we also uh, check the past diversity. It is used to, ev to evaluate the redundancy of the past that we can use to recover the connectivity. And the experiment show that most of, uh, in most of the experiments, we can find the past diversity that is between two and four. And only one experiment over the 33 experiments, the past diversity is less than two. The last uh, metric is the shift to the past. Since it is difficult for us to get the traffic metrics between each two ASs. So we use the shifted paths to indicate the shifted traffic load. So in, the, in all the experiments, on average, the shifted paths is between about 4 to seven, uh, 17. And it's the moderate traffic load shifted onto the unaffected links. So after evaluate, evaluating the potential results we need to ask some practical problems. How can we use these potential resources? In fact, there can be many methods to use these uh, resources. Uh, here, we just uh, give some, give one possible ways. First, I'd like to uh, introduce some economic model, it, it just for reference. The helper in the uh, disaster or in the emergency may not be free. Uh, they may here, by upgrading a peer link to a provider custom link, or by adding a provider custom link in the IXP, the helper B in this figure, uh, the helper A in this figure must be paid by the victim ASA. The price can be determined beforehand, like something is doing now between the uh, airlines. And it can pay on bandwidth and duration of bytes during the emergency. Next, we want to do something to speed up the negotiation process or the communication process during the uh, emergency or the disaster. For this purpose, we need one, one communication channel and one communication protocol. For the peers, there are already a direct, direct connection with different peers. So there are the communication channel there. 
For co-located AS is in a SIMXP, we can broadcast the message via the uh, switches. And this, the message can be encrypted if there is some uh, privacy concern there. So this is uh, a figure to show the communication process. First, the victim AS will send a query to its peers or its co-located RSP, RXP ASs, which name the potential helper on the right hand of this picture, and ask who can connect to some specific destination ASs. On receiving the query, the potential helpers will first check its connectivity to that specific AS, use some tools like Tristar. And second, it will check some available bandwidth it can provide. It can provide through some active measurement tools like YAS, payload, and so on. If anyone finds that he can be the helper, a reply message will send back to the victim AS and tell the victim AS how much he can provide. Then the victim AS will select uh, the helper from his uh, own angle and send back a ACK, ACK message. At last, uh, the BGP session can be set up. And the deal after the emergency, the BGP session also can be withdrawn. So there is another uh, problem is the uh, the victim AS will choose one or some helper ISP to be his helper. And from a single victim ISP perspective, he wants to buy transit from a minimum number of ASs to recover all the traffic at the least cost. So that's uh, what we are proposed and we are doing now. It is also a working progress work and we are looking forward to feedback and collaborations from XPs and ISPs. And quickly summarize uh, what, what we, we are doing now, uh, what we have done. First, we point out a new venue for internet failure recovery. And through the uh, evaluation, uh, we gave, gave the evaluation of potential routing diversities by XP and PR with the most complete AS topology graph. Under the investigation of the three disaster model, there are 40% to 80% of affected source destination AS pairs can be recovered by IXP and PR with multiple passes and moderate shifted paths. And also possible and practical me mechanisms to utilize potential routing diversities are mentioned in this presentation. So that's it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, we have time for questions. Randy Bush, IJ. Um, this would seem to rely on the uh, Rexford Gal Valley Free Customer Preferred Hypothesis. Yeah. Secondly, on the belief that you can use route views and risk data to come up with a reasonable AS topology graph of the Internet. And three, that the data plane follows the control plane. All three of those hypotheses are highly questionable, and there are significant recent papers showing that uh, you should not trust them. Okay. Thank you for your comments. That's a fair point, and uh, I think I'd like to add that uh, there was also some work on, uh, I believe you're modeling NAS as a node. So there is also some work on a better model for NAS with interconnections inside, so something to look at. Any other questions? All right, folks, thanks a lot for staying and uh, not choosing the peering buff. Uh, thanks for your help, and uh, feel free to catch the speakers and give them feedback. Thank you.